which is really incredible. So that means they're giving us books for free and they're paying our bar tab for tonight. So we're able to raise money and have incredible programming, which is really no small feat for a publisher. So we want to say a really big thank you to them. And again, we want to say a thank you to all of you for coming out tonight. We really encourage you to buy books everywhere, but we especially encourage you to buy books here at Housing Works. This one's pretty incredible to my left, and all of the other books in this store are also for sale, so we would really encourage you to buy many, many books while you're here in this store tonight. There's a number of ways that you can also help out Housing Works. You can also donate your old books. You can volunteer your time. You can host an event just like this one. You can also rent out this space for private functions. We have really beautiful weddings in the bookstore almost every single weekend. So if you happen to be looking for a venue to use like that, or you need somebody cute tonight, you should totally come and get my car and find out about our rentals program, which is really awesome. You can also stay in touch with Housing Works by subscribing to our newsletter, which comes just two times a month. It has free readings and concerts and parties, storytelling competitions, book launches, comedy nights. You can catch up with Housing Works in general and the bookstore on social media, on Twitter and on Instagram if you want to post about tonight's event or at Housing Works BKS, which is a really great way to keep in touch with all the different events here. We have book launches and public programming like this almost every single Monday through Thursday. Fall is our busiest time. Honestly, starting tonight, we've got something pretty much every single night, Monday through Thursday. So we really hope you guys will come back and see us tonight if this is your first time in the bookstore. All right, now it's my honor to turn the stage over to tonight's program. We're here to celebrate the launch of this incredible book by Tim Murphy. <laughs> it's a really special occasion when we here at the bookstore are able to present the intersection of literary life and activism, which is such an incredible part of the work that all of the people do who are part of this organization. So it's a real honor to host him and to present this really special novel on our stage. Tim Murphy has dedicated the last 20 years to reporting on HIV and AIDS. He's written on the subject for Out, The Advocate, New York Magazine, and New York Magazine where his cover story on PrEP was nominated for a GLAAD Media Award for Outstanding Magazine Journalism. He also covers LGBT issues, arts, pop culture, travel, and fashion for publications including the New York Times and Connie Mass Traveler. Chris Dora has already been widely praised by New York Magazine, Nanta Literary, and many, many other outlets. Garth Greenwell, writing in the Washington Post, calls the book rich, complicated, hugely ambitious. No book has made me feel so intensely, not just the ravages of AIDS, but the devastating cost of activism. Christodor recounts a crucial chapter in the history of queer life, which is to say in the history of American life. It's also, for all the despair it documents, a book about hope. In Murphy's 2021, there is a cure for AIDS. We're going to begin tonight with a short reading from Tim, and following the reading, we'll be joined in conversation by Kenyon Farrow. Kenyon is an award-winning writer and activist. He spent the last 15 years working in social movements on campaigns and projects large and small, community-based, national and global in scope. Well known for his racial and economic justice work within LGBTQ organizing, he is the former executive director of Queers for Economic Justice. His work in HIV AIDS has also been well documented and he's currently, he is now the current US and global, policy, global health policy director for Treatment Action Group as an independent AIDS research and policy think tank fighting for better treatment, a vaccine, a cure for AIDS, and he's also expanded his work to include TV policy and advocacy. Thank you all so much for coming tonight and we hope we'll see you again sometime soon. so many 
so many corners become the fabric of your life and become your family and they're like outwardly rippling layers of friendships and families that overlap and that speak to one another and I mean I'm just so deeply moved looking around tonight and seeing friends from every chapter of my life in New York since I moved here 25 years ago this summer and friends who've been with me through ups and downs, through really good times, really bad times. Friends who have been my partners in activism, in wellness, <laughs> in, <laughs> in art, <laughs> in, in literature, in, in media, and in so many ways. It's, it's so profoundly moving, and I thank every one of you from the bottom of my heart for coming out tonight. I just can't tell you how much you use me. First of all, to my Asian Susan Gollum, who saw something in this book and um, helped put it out there. Uh, to Morgan Entrekin and everyone at Grove, Judy Cottonson, Deb Seeger, John Mark Bowling, my wonderful editor, Peter Blackstock, Nicole Nyan. Um, you guys have just treated me so well, and for a freelance journalist <laughs> to be treated well, <laughs> paid on time and to not have to do what you say but for it to actually be a choice was a luxury beyond I can't I just felt like the, the, the reluctant diva you know, <laughs> uh, so I, I want to say thank you to Grove and I want to say thank you to some dear friends who put some very shrewd eyes on this book for me early on like Sarah Burns, James Hanham, Maria Stryer, Mark Lydorf, Jeffrey Golick, um, and then there were others further down the line. Your, your read on this book and the feedback you gave me helped me make it a better book with, with deeper characters. So I just want to thank you guys so much for that, as well as for your friendship. Um, and I want to thank Gaze Against Guns on which you're <laughs> Center where ACT UP uh, did the work they did. So that, the convergence of the two things in my life this summer has been really exhausting and <laughs> left me with a sexy friend of Caro. But it's, it's been really wonderful. It's, it's been a great summer so far. Um, so I will read, I think of the book as sort of a big, lumpy, drawn out soap opera, and I don't. <laughs> I actually don't really think there are a lot of sections that hold up well to, to being read. Um, so I'm actually just, I'm going to read this section that Pause Magazine was so um, generously uh, excerpted, and I was so proud to have it excerpted in Pause, which is a magazine that means so much to me that really gave this girl a chance. <laughs> Why, I don't know. Um, we used to call it the, the Island of Misfit editors and writers. But, we had a good time there, and um, so uh, they, they, had, they ran this excerpt, and this is what I'm going to read. And just really quickly, um, the book has two timelines. It starts the weekend before 9-11, and a sort of young, sort of affluent couple in the East Village who live in Chris Tudora have, a few years before, adopted a little boy who, whose mother died of AIDS uh, in the very early 90s. So there are two timelines. There's one timeline that starts there and moves forward into, into the near future, and it's about that family. And there's another timeline that starts in 1981, which is the year that you know, AIDS, the epidemic, was identified in New York and LA. And, um, and a lot of that timeline is about his mother, uh, Isabel Mendez, who um, finds her way, who uh, is diagnosed uh, with HIV, and then who, and who finds her way to um, to activism 
and particularly to an act, a leader in the activist movement named uh, Pepter. So this is the, this is not the first night, actually, but it's, it's the second night that they, they meet. Um, <clears throat> the rain had already pulled so deeply off the curb that Izzy was about to step into it in her sandal up to her ankle. And by the way, I'm not going to try to recreate any of the various New York accents in this book. It's, it's as it is, because there are a lot. And I've already heard the I've already heard the audio version. And well, I mean, some of these characters sound like they got came off the boat four days ago. <laughs> um, had already pulled so deeply off the curb that Izzy was about to step into it in her sandal up to her ankle when Ricky, his bag of flyers already wet, went, whoa, girl, and sort of lifted her from the waist so she missed the big puddle. They were leaving a diner where they'd gone to eat after the big meeting. Her, Hector, this guy, Ricky, who was obviously his boyfriend, and a guy named Corey who really didn't look good. She had stood alongside Hector throughout the rambunctious meeting, a bit overwhelmed and dazed, but also strangely relieved and safe and then when it adjourned, Hector, and she could tell that Hector was a big shot here, had introduced her to a bunch of women, some of them Latinas, but most of them looking like lesbianas. And before she knew it, she was on a committee to try to get the federal definition of AIDS expanded to include more symptoms that only women have, like not getting your periods regularly. That had been happening to her. And after Hector had said, come on, we're getting something to eat at Joe Jr., come with us. So she had, sitting there with a bowl of tomato soup and grilled cheese, while the guys talked mainly about a Chinese drug and whether you could take it for AIDS or not, because Corey wanted to know. Overall, Hector didn't think it was a good idea. I think you should wait and get into parallel tracking with DDI, he told Corey, who took a deep breath, as though he were digesting this new idea. Everyone had been talking about this new drug, DDI. But this, this chapter, by the way, takes place in May of 1989. Um, had been talking about this new drug, DDI, at the meeting, Izzy had noticed. Could this be the drug that was going to change everything? What if she lived? She sipped her soup and listened quietly to Hector and Corey go back and forth. There was a lot of new terminology she was learning tonight. Some folks had told her they didn't know jack shit about AIDS or science or the body or anything before they started coming to the meetings. And now, only a few months in, they could hold their own, read medical papers, follow a conversation. Maybe that would happen to her, too. She already had dental knowledge, and at her dental hygienist job, she suffered intense guilt that she had told no colleagues she was infected, as well as terror that someone might somehow find out and she'd be fired, or worse, that she might somehow bleed into a patient's mouth and infect them. Ricky put his arm around her. She knew he was in his 20s, but he looked like he could be 12 with that little boy face. How's your stupid sandwich, girl? He asked her. She laughed. It's fine. I didn't eat much today before. I was nervous about coming to the meeting. Well, you came and you made a splash, he said. She liked Ricky. He reminded her of when you were flipping TV channels and came across an old musical set on a farm or something. That kind of guy. All American and smiley and wholesome, even though he had a punk haircut. The boys were getting up now, talking about going to dance at a bar called Boy Bar. She didn't think she'd ever been there with Toby. Maybe it was new. What are you going to do now, Ricky asked her. She shrugged. I guess I'm going to take the subway back to Queens. God, it was so stressful living with her family, hiding this from them. What if she started looking like Corey? How would she hide with them? Come dance with us, Ricky said. She laughed. Me? No, you guys go ahead. Corey put his arm around her. Oh, honey, please. If I can go for a while, so can you. She looked up at Hector. Come on with us for a while, Chica, he said. The place was basically a dark pit with loud music, like Paradise Garage had been. Tavi, she thought, and she walked in, the music's draw hitting her. They were walking forward in a crowd of guys, and she felt herself shuffling, her hand rising to her neck. Oh, she had pushed down these feelings at Tavi. But God, he had been like her brother, far more than her real brother. Well, maybe he was more like her sister. And she couldn't bring herself to tell him in his final months when he was so sick that she had the same thing. He died without knowing. She pushed down all this hobby stuff for months now. 
She hadn't set foot in a club, heard this thump, thump music since Tommy. Hector spied her, put a hand on her neck. You okay? He shouted in her ear. I haven't been to a club since Tavi. She shouted back into his ear on her tippy toes. He put his arm around her. It's too much for you? I can walk out with you. I can walk you out. She didn't share that she barely stepped into a club since that night five years ago. The night she was fairly certain she'd gotten the virus from that moreno in the back of the car. Four years later, she started having the private area problems, catching colds that seemed never to go away, noticing her glands were always hard and swollen. The doctor she visited asked her if she had any reason to believe she might have HIV. She didn't have to think back too hard. Literally from the week after the encounter with the Moreno, she wondered if she'd done a stupid thing, especially as she read more and more about the disease. She'd insisted on a condom the two times she had sex with someone since. I had sex once with a bisexual guy, she told the doctor, without a condom. The two weeks she waited for the test results, she stopped in a church every day to light a candle and pray she didn't have it. When the doctor called her back in and told her that she did in fact have it, she felt an immediate disgust with herself for being so naive and trusting as to think God would have cut her a break. What a fool she was. She wasn't getting the things she wanted out of life, and this was Faith's last laugh with the sad, not much life of Isabel and Guinness. That sense she long buried that perhaps the world really wasn't a fair and good place, as dictated by the church, came rushing up in a hot, humiliating blaze in her throat. So I'm gonna get more sick and die, she asked the doctor, tears welling in her eyes. And meanwhile, she calculated to herself she'd be fired from her job and would have to endure the scorn and rejection of her family and the neighborhood, and that would be fun. How soon do I have? Don't look at it that way, the doctor had said. You're in decent health now. Your T cells are high. We'll monitor you, and if they ever get really low, we can talk about AZT. What? It's a drug for HIV. Does it cure it? No, but it can keep it in check for a while, and other drugs will be coming down the pipe. So meanwhile, eat well, don't drink or smoke, exercise, don't get too stressed, you'll be okay. Taking out her anger at a cheap gym after work was Izzy's concession to the doctor's advice. Otherwise, she suppressed the diagnosis, pushed it down inside her. If the doctor said she didn't have to worry about it, she wouldn't, and she wouldn't tell anyone either. The life became very stressful, and she found herself constantly short-tempered or breaking up privately into tears. She felt as though she may as well be walking around wearing a sign that said, I have AIDS. She feared that if her brother ever found out, and she knew all along she had the virus after she held and played with her little niece, he turned on her in rage. Then, a few months before, she started noticing in the papers and on the news that there was this group, mostly gay guys, who were out there blocking traffic and getting arrested, demanding that the city and the country do more to stop the disease. She followed them with a secret thrill. They weren't afraid if anyone thought they had the disease or not. They were all over the papers. But it all led to her creeping to the meeting tonight and to a feeling of colossal relief. So now, the music stealing up into her feet, she let herself collapse into Hector's arm a bit. No, I'm okay, she told Hector. I want to dance a little. Yeah, I know, girl. We haven't danced together in a while. Oh my god, shut up. That's the first back to a prior chapter. She slaps his arm, mortified and smiling. He tossed back his head and let out a deep, satisfied laugh. Suddenly she realized he'd lost those nerdy, chunky glasses he had the night he met her. That's why he seemed sexier and looser. That, she figured, and his new muscles. And maybe because he was so popular in this activist crowd. Come on, Chica, he said. They got beers and went downstairs, which was packed and sweaty. A huge drag queen with oversized false eyelashes and a blonde cotton candy wig sailed through the crowd like a cruise ship. Kissing hello, left and right. That's the lady bunny, Ricky Shy. She is a son. Is he not it? Oh. The music got her excited. She jacked her body along with the voice. Except for her periods, she wasn't sick yet. She felt fine. She started to let herself think that maybe everything would turn out all right. Then she noticed frail Corey standing by the bar alone with his beer, sort of staring into space. But Hector and Ricky were with her. They watched her jack her body. It went, work, girl. 
They were bumping and grinding on either side of her, pressing her in the middle. Woo! She went. She felt better, and she didn't see, nor could she hear them over the music, when Ricky pressed a little pastel smiley face pill into Hector's hand. Hector glanced down at it. Where'd you get that? He shouted in Ricky's ear. Corey gave them to me, Ricky said. Corey? He shouldn't be doing that shit. That's why he gave them to me. <laughs> Hector frowned. I have a lot of work in meetings tomorrow. One pill's only gonna last you a few hours, Ricky said. You'll be fine, it's only 10.30. I suppose you already took yours. Ricky grinned a Cheshire cap grin. But Hector felt a rage rising. You don't fucking care about yourself, Ricky. You made me so fucking mad. Ricky grabbed his arm. Don't go there tonight. Let's have fun with this girl. Don't you dare fucking give her an ex. Ricky looked offended. Do you think I would? They just stared at each other for a second, mechanically dancing in place. Finally, Hector shook his head and popped the pill in his mouth, washing it down with a swig of beer. Ooh, bad boy, Ricky shot him. You just don't care, Hector said again. Ricky shrugged. You care too much, he said. But said it smiling, then thrust his tongue in Hector's mouth before Hector could respond. We always hang in a buffalo stance. We do the dive every time we dance, like the song went. Hector could feel Ricky's powers of attitude begin to exert themselves over him now. And when he finally pulled away from the kiss, he saw the new girl, Issy, slipping away through the crowd, which now included about three dozen people from the meeting. Where was she going? He resigned himself to wait for the ex to kick in, danced, something he taught himself to do in the intervening years, how to move his body. They should feel good about themselves, about parallel tracking, he told himself, watching Ricky bump it with Mickey, the magenta hair dyke. Ricky was in really good spirits now, Hector knew, because Ricky loved exing and dancing all night, even if it was a Monday night with Ivana's roots to do in the morning. <laughs> Data suggested that AZT plus DGI would squelch the pathogen, Hector reminded himself. Things were probably going to change in the rest of 1989. Symptoms and mortalities were going to plunge. Then bang. That moment when the X kicked in and the world pops to life in day glow colors. That fever she waited with only some joy. Can you feel it? Ricky asked in his arms. And now, oh God, the Shep Pettibone remix of the song this summer. When you call my name, it's like a little prayer. I'm down on my knees. I want to be there. The room screamed and collapsed into the pounding beats. Hector followed suit with some of his more extroverted buddies from the meeting, he pulled off his t-shirt, stuck it in the bend of his jean shorts. Ricky's ass was in his hands, Ricky's tongue in his mouth. Ricky was here, Ricky was here. It was summertime, Madonna was on their side. Parallel tracking was coming. Everything was going to be okay.